I, I need to be going to your parties, I have to say. Um, so there's a moment in the book that really stuck with me, which was when the doctor um, hears some bad news about a patient, and I'm not going to spoil it, but uh, they say nothing could have been done. Um, and it struck me that when speaking of, of sort of reaching out for meaning, that sort of felt a little bit like a mantra. And I've certainly, you know, run into it with people who've been dealing with climate change, people who've been dealing with, you know, the pandemic, uh, nothing to be done, nothing to be done. Is that a virgin, version of finding meaning? Can you sort of have nihilism as meaning? Wow, what a fascinating question. Um, nothing could have been done. Um, I, I can't think of a single instance in which nothing could have been done. So I, I, <laughs> um, I, I think that, um, you know, of all dimensions of spiritual life, the one that has the greatest impact on our brain is love of neighbor and service. So even if it didn't, um, something could have been done, whether or not it instrumentally affected the outcome, it could have been done out of love. It could have been done out of interest. It could have been done out of being sisters and brothers. So I, I think there's always something to be done, whether or not we instrumentally win the day, we can show up for each other. And when we do, we see life differently. Um, I, do, do, you, do you think that that doctor received that that same kick of, you know, it's okay, it's in a, it's in a higher power, um, granted not altruism and not connectedness, um, but, you know, it strikes me as, as, as that being slightly, um, you know, mantra-like. Do you think if you, you put, put him in an MRI at the yeah. same time as someone who'd said, God is looking over me, um, mm -hmm. there would have been a similar, similar response? Oh, very interesting. Um, so a fatalism sort of a view. Oh, that's interesting. Um, wow. So I, I'm not aware of a study that addressed that head on. Um, but if you're saying something that sort of moves towards the serenity prayer, the wisdom to know the difference, um, that is not necessarily a fatalism, right? That the wisdom to know the difference is when, when we have to meet life halfway, right? Mm -hmm. This is, um, in the book, um, a lot could have been done for that patient. And the fact that it wasn't, I think, was because that patient was only looked at through a narrow treatment theory, yep. as opposed to really opening up a field of connection and hearing where her heart was. So um, that story from the book, I think, is a story of the 20th century of how psychotherapy minus witness, minus engagement of the spiritual heart um, is not just only partial, it can cause harm. Uh, iatrogenic harm in the hospital is when I go with a moderate condition, I might have, you know, a broken arm and I leave with TB, I'm much worse. That is what happens when you deliver a psychotherapy that is disintegrated of the spiritual core from all else. If you look at the level of the brain, the brain, the spiritual awareness is a superordinate from which come other lines of development, moral, social, ethical, and to disintegrate the spiritual core from living is to, is to cause harm. Right now, our society de facto has done that. Right, you come to school and you are asked, "How do you know that?" Well, we're knowers in many forms. We have empiricism, we have logic, we have intuition, we have mystical knowing. We're knowers in many forms. But I spent a lot of time in school with very loving, well-intentioned teachers who only wanted to hear about logic and empiricism. And if I had an intuitive knowing or I encountered a mystical realization, um, we don't talk about that here. And when we don't talk about that here, you say to the child, it's not real, it's not important, and you certainly disintegrate through omission that form of knowing from experience and from decision making. When we looked using a form of MRI called DTI, you look at um, basically the connections and structures between uh, regions in the brain, we found that people who avail themselves of multiple forms of knowing, who ask a question of the head, what is my purpose? Why did this happen today? Why did I lose my job? Why are we sitting here with COVID? And who can receive of the 19 logical answers, the one that's true through the knowing of the heart, tuition, intuition, perhaps a synchronicity, unifying head and heart, people who avail themselves of multiple forms of knowing have myelinated tracks between regions of the brain. They've built the highways, they've paved the road so that any moment can be understood through multiple forms of knowing. And that is, you know, through the lens of neuroscience, a better brain, that is a fuller life. That is a life realizing who we really are, how we're built. Fascinating. Uh, jumping back to something that you said 
um, during the talk and, and, and in that answer about sort of the uniquely 20th century um, malaise. It feels to me, as, as time has, has moved on and as society has progressed, that um, choice in terms of lifestyle has, has blossomed. You know, even thinking back to my parents' generation, you know, you go to university, you, you try and get a good enough degree, and then, and then you, know, you go and get married, you go to church, you, you know, go to certain places. Now, you know, my generation is dealing with, you know, monogamy's out the window and, and you know, the climate's out the window. And do you, to what extent do you think so sort of reducing the amount of choice and, and um, making life a bit simpler maybe behooves a little bit of, of meaning because it feels like, you know, I'm trying to find meaning in a million different places in my life at, at the moment. And maybe looking back on a generation where like, no, no, this, this, you know, God is real and you can sort of channel your spirituality through that. To what extent is choice a, a poison chalice is basically what I'm saying. Right. So you raise an important point because there's two types of choice, right? There's choice in our action plan, in our achieving plan. Um, where am I going to live and what job am I going to get next week? And we can address that um, outward choice through, you know, let's make a list and see what's going to advance me. And let's, you know, and, but um, we also have choice, not only about our outward life, but about our inward life. Right. And we have a choice to engage our deep inner seat of awareness, whether it's through prayer or meditation, whether it's through music, we have a choice to expand our awareness. And particularly when we feel surly and cut off and depressed and annoyed, we have a choice to enter into a deeper, more unitive, loving state of being. So that choice as a choice of awareness may naturally open up a path that's true and right. And instead of decisions being agonizing and anxiety provoking because there's 42 different options, you know, there's 30 different apartments and 10 different roommates and two different jobs. Well, actually you can multiply them and have thousands of options. From the view of an awakened heart, from the view of the awakened brain, there's a deep inner knowing about where my path is taking me. And of these four apartments, I know that this one is my home. And as much as he's a wonderful fellow, this is the one that's right for me. And as much, you know, there's a deep inner wisdom that although there's many logically wonderful opportunities, my path, my truth is leading me here. And that decision-making, it's almost like a matter of a um, realized inner life. It's more of a teleology of, of a, I don't want to say constrained choice. It's more of a sense of being called. Mm. and it's much less agonizing uh, I'm, I'm gonna start practicing that thank you um okay so we're gonna move on to some audience questions because they are fantastic and um audience not too late please type them into the q a um and i so do want to say one thing luke because you raised your generation yeah. your generation is fabulous your <laughs> generation you've got this right you know we're very sorry about messing up the earth and ruining the climate and creating wars and all this but your generation is not just going to fix this you're going to reboot the way we live from you have a de facto implicit awakened awareness you know that we are one you, know, you connect online and you don't look at people's shallow body body bio body suit you connect via the consciousness and you pull information out of the air and know that consciousness is available at all moments you are de facto an awakened generation and the awakened brain gives language and science to that you are already implicitly an awakened generation and you are going to create not just fix old problems in a sort of tit for tat way you're going to regenerate society as you gain voice like this fabulous show here as you take on leadership roles in society that are implicitly awakened choices you're going to create an awakened society the science in the awakened brain mirrors what you're already implicitly doing and it's incredibly important um you know you're not going to make a 20th mistake 20th century mistake that if you make a bat sick, you're not going to make a human sick. You're not going to make a 20th century mistake that if someone in China is sick, someone in UK or you know Italy is not going to get sick. That is old 20th century thinking. You wouldn't have done that, right? Cool. And I'm not implicating individuals. I'm implicating a generation of thought that we've outgrown and the world has outgrown. And the, the, you're the awakened generation. Now, some of us can ride with you. There are people of all ages who get it, but your generation almost uniformly is the most non-racist generation that we've seen. Your generation almost uniformly is the most faithful in the path of life because you're not institutionally connected. You don't hold on for dear life and look at what pin is on someone's lapel. You, you, and you get to know your path through knowing, inner knowing. So you're nine tenths of the way there. I hope the awakened brain is read by everyone. I really hope your generation takes it as 
mirroring, validating how you're already living, and then something of a roadmap for how you rise to the mantle of making new decisions for society. No, I, I really hope so. That said, I'm pretty sure that shallow bodysuit was an early name for Tinder. I mean, have you have you, have you been on Tinder? I, I feel like that would destroy a lot of your, uh, your <laughs> generation and, and has sort of thing. TikTok as well. I don't, 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 don't delve into that. Um, okay, so um, moving on to the audience questions, because there are some really good ones. Um, there are two, actually, one from Zan and one from Olivia. Um, about psychedelics, uh, psilocybin, LSD, um, the notion that um, sort of promise uh, an opening to depression and, and shattering the ego um, and the spiritual world. Could you speak to that a little bit, please? Yes. So I think it is possible to jump start awareness, but I wouldn't then just send someone out into the world. I would give them an opportunity, whether with friends or a group or a shaman or a mystic or a rabbi or a psychiatrist to metabolize the experience and integrate it. Because the end game is not to have had a transcendent experience and kind of be left dangling. I've seen that go well and I've seen that go not well for people. The end game is to integrate that into your life so that the same boyfriend, girlfriend, apartment and job now is full of the numinous. Can you bring it home? And I think that integration is very important. I think it's irresponsible to jack people up full of awareness and not offer the opportunity for some type of deep, soulful realization of what that means in everyday life. Now, people, there are those who simply do it on their own. There's people who do it in groups. But I think it is in its, you know, indigenous traditions, people prepared for the experience and afterwards they integrated it. And so to continue that through transcendent practice, through reflection, through what does that mean for this guy on the bus who's really annoying me? To continue it for, you know, what is my deep calling in life really? You know, um, can I share? You know, what do I believe? What does that mean for my relationships? We're eminently capable of that, but that is the message that I would say goes hand in hand with um, awakening experiences. Mm. Actually, you mentioned sort of the the, the natural experience. We have we've had um, Professor David Nutt and, and Michael Pollan on, and they've both complained about how LSD clinical trials are done in you know often in just like blue rooms with clinic you know and, and and it feels like that's not the place to have deep awakening you know set and setting and all that well and, it, and it's not enough to just let someone out in the hall afterwards so i'll give you an example whether it's through induced or developed over time meditative practices i've i've seen people whether it's you know very quickly and radically or very gradually um not supported with the integration into you know how to show up at work the next day and love your boss how to show up at work the next day and be patient with your assistant. You know, how, what does it mean that we're all, can you see the soul right next to you? And that translation is everything, right? I, I've seen people not know on what level of reality the transcendent awareness is real. And I'll give an example. I know someone who was a Buddhist nun. Okay, this is not from, uh, this is not a pharmacologically induced experience. She was a Buddhist nun and she for three years, three months, three weeks and three days, was in a state of deep meditation and expanded consciousness, profound transcendent awareness. And when she came out, the first wave was incredibly confusing. There was light and there was sound. No one helped her land back on into um, material reality. And then the second wave was even more confusing. She would say, the Dalai Lama is calling me. And she'd put on her robes. She'd go outside in her suburban home with her suitcase and wait. Right? And it gradually, you know, it was lunchtime, it was late afternoon, and when the sun set, she looked confused and sad, right? Because was he calling her? Well, yes, probably on a deep spiritual level, she is called to a life of sacred service. But the confusion about what level of reality, is he pulling up in a car, or is it a calling of purpose and spiritual opening that there was a, will be guided? You know? So that, that work is incredibly important. And um, the confusion, you know, and the, in, in the intolerance you know, I've heard people say after some experiences, I um, I had a tremendous experience in Costa Rica, and it was it was a pharmacologically induced experience, and I came home, and now everyone here is so domesticated. Okay, mm. if you have a great awakening, you go back and you bring them with you. Relational spirituality is part of the deal, right? And so wonderful if you've had an opening, fabulous, and now the work begins for yourself and for everyone else around you. Yeah. 
Oh, I, I love that. Bring them back with you. I love that. Um, Tracy asks, uh, how do we stay open to the universe when there is so much pain in the world? Afghanistan at the moment, for instance, it's almost too painful to feel the connectedness to everything and anyone. It's a tough question. I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right. Um, it's a beautiful and painful point. Um, of course, it's true. And I'll share with you, there's someone with whom I was working just within the past two days, the past 48 hours, who um, practiced and found her awakened seat of awareness. And she had always sensed it was there. She felt it was real. And the first thing she did when she realized that consciousness is non-local, that our seat of awareness from a 21st century view is picking up on something real. It's not just that we perceive love or that we feel one. We're picking up just as we see a chair and we know on some level there's a chair, we feel oneness and see interconnectedness and love and it is real. We're seeing something real. That's a consciousness based of basis of reality that awakened brains perceive. This woman said the first thing she went home and did was enter into a state of awakened awareness and send love to the women in Afghanistan. She gave them something. And she said, I just know that non-locality is real, that what happens here has everything to do with what happens here, that consciousness, same consciousness can be in two places, if you will, superposition. I just know that's true. And I know however they felt it, I sent them something. So, you know, she wants to do more than that with her hands too, but, but that is the point that um, we can feel their pain, but we can also give them something if we know our full, full inherent possibility of being conduits vessels for love and consciousness mm. and i remember reading a, a while ago a study that says um you know that with anxiety disorders just giving some someone something to do and and you know some control over something and it's probably no coincidence that so many religions you know you pray for a, a group or you do loving kindness meditation for a group that it does actually give you some something to do because just sitting here and being sad is is even worse and, and that the sadness, you know, it's not that we feel sad. We are sad because we're detecting, you know, like a thumb on a hot stove, something inherently tragic. And, you know, can that be our invitation to enter into that field of consciousness, send love? And our actions follow, of course. But the more we do that, the more others are ignited in love, the more others are entrained, if you will, by the love and consciousness, the spirit of life. And that's important. You know, you affect 400 people that way. And so those, they affect 400 people and some of them live in Afghanistan. Yeah. A, a final question uh, by Natalia, um, which is partly uh, sort of addressed in the book, but I, I think it'd be really good to sort of clarify. Um, how would you differentiate personal spirituality and organized religion? Um, and, and were there any types of negative spirituality? Did you find any effects of being religious or spiritual that had negative it's a very good question. So the dimension of live spiritual life where the awakened brain focus has only led to good things in people's life, which is an awareness of the transcendent loving reality to be used in tandem, our awakened awareness with our achieving awareness. And when we can use them in tandem, ask a question of the heart and discern an answer with the head and vice versa, um, life is more inspired and full. But the question, as I heard it was, is there anything in the body of research across all threads of spiritual and religious life, which are different, you know, um, we opened with the clarity that if you envision an overlapping Venn diagram, spirituality, religion, spirituality is our birthright, one third heritable, we're hardwired as spiritual beings. Religion is entirely environmentally translated. It is the gift of our ancestors, our community. It, is, it can be part of the two thirds embrace, but it is not a hardwired capacity. So every one of us needs sunshine, food, water, and nutrition, and we need spiritual life. That may be entirely separate or it may be engaged with religious life, but religion is entirely environmentally transmitted. Spirituality is a seat of awareness that we're all endowed with from day one in our lives. Okay. So anything over here or over here that causes problems is the question I'm hearing. And there is an answer to that, which is um, when people have a lot of R, a lot of religion, but don't feel spirituality through it, right? So there's profoundly spiritual people who pray and cry with the transcendent truth. They are both spiritual and religious, right? And there's profoundly spiritual people who walk in nature and see the mother bird feed the baby bird and think of their child. But there are people who feel religious, but not spiritual right? And when there is a very, very um, rigid and close adherence to creed, particularly creed that says, um, 
you know, you are punished or you are bad if you don't do things right, right? There tends to be a very thin line. And as long as you obey that rule and stay on the very thin line, you're less likely to, you know, be in unwanted situations. You're less likely to be addicted. You're less likely to drink. But if you cross that very thin line of the rule and you're religious, but not spiritual, and you have a close adherence to creed in particular, a rigid adherence to creed, but don't feel the love of the universe. Don't feel the love of God. Don't feel loved and worthy in and of, you know, as a spiritual being on earth, just feel the rule. Once that thin line is crossed, there's nothing to really catch us. And that actually in large studies, we found that people with rigid adherence, but no close felt sense of spiritual connection are actually more at risk for addiction and downward spirals and unwanted relations once that thin line is crossed. So that's, um, you know, again, there's many threads within religion. There's many threads within spirituality. The awakened brain focuses on how we can realize our fuller nature and thrive. But there are threads within religious life that can cause people problems when they aren't filled out with a felt inherent spiritual life, our birthright. And, and those threads are the furthest away from what you were talking about earlier, which is altruism and sort of ego dissolution. That adherence to the rules and everything in, in, in your life, it, it fixes the ego almost, doesn't it? Yeah, right. Well, no, there are people, of course, I want to be totally inclusive, who are profoundly spiritual and realize their faith and their commitment to God through mm-hmm. adherence to creed, right? But they have both. They have S and R. It's when there's R and no S that people don't have that, aren't caught. And Ken Parham and his colleagues have felt that sometimes people don't even feel punished or bad or unworthy if they have a view, a rigid view of being unworthy or breaking the rules without a felt sense of being loved, without a felt sense of being inherently worthy. Hmm. Dr. Lisa, I could talk to you for hours and I'm sure that everyone here would listen to you for hours, but unfortunately we have to end there. Um, Please everyone check out Lisa's new book, The Awakened Brain, The Psychology of Spirituality and Our Search for Meaning. Um, Please do head over to the the How to Academy website for more. There's, there's, the, there's the book um please do head over to our website for more speakers um lots of exciting stuff coming up speaking of exciting speakers lisa thank you so much thank you for 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 the last hour and thank you audience for all your brilliant questions we hope to see you all very soon stay uh, happy and healthy and lisa the last word goes to you it was wonderful to join you it was terrific to be in your thought community and i just want to say to everyone you are the agents you are the torch bearers you are the awakeners so we're in this together we have a mission Amazing. Take care, everyone.